You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Hi, this is Frank Moore for Life on Gabriola TV. And today, as part of the series we're doing on the healthcare situation in the central Vancouver Island area, including Gabriola, we are talking with Jeff Malmgren, uh, president of the Gabriola Healthcare Foundation, about um, what's going on here on Gabriola. Jeff, thank you for taking the time to do this. Oh, thank you. Before we get into uh, the healthcare situation specifically, I understand that the foundation and the clinic are separate entities, but how do you describe the relationship between the two? Well, I mean, the foundation nominally um, holds the building. And so all of the folks who work within the building, the lab, and some of the services, other services, and certainly the clinic, the are, the, are actually uh, renters in the building. That said, particularly with the clinic, we have more than simply a, a landlord-tenant um, relationship. We tend to try to work fairly closely with them to support their needs and particularly to support the needs of the community. Right. Now, to begin with some good news, uh, recently the uh, BC Ministry of Health came out with some data that showed as of 2021, Gabriola had the second highest percentage of people with a general practitioner, with what we generally call a family doctor. In the Vancouver Island area, only Parksville had a higher percentage. Uh, does that, that surprised me. Does that surprise you? And if, if not, then how did we luck out? Well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all. And in fact, we didn't luck out. You know, if you take a look at the, the foundation and the history of the foundation and the clinic, I mean, there was an effort from the community to build a building, which mm -hmm. was amazing, mm -hmm. really quite astounding. No other community in our, the, the central area, Vancouver Island area could speak like that. In fact, probably not in BC the way that it happened here, but it was more than that. Uh, there was, you know, when you looked at the way, particularly the doctors came together to run the clinic, they did it with an eye to making it a very attractive place to practice. And it became that. They have team-based care, they support one another very well. They've done, they've done an awful lot of work to create a great environment to practice. So that's what really brought and kept people to Gabriola uh, at, the, at the clinic. That said, unfortunately, it is old news. Um, and it does sort of point to the, 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 the tenuous nature of keeping doctors in small communities. Right. We did lose a couple of doctors, um, not because they didn't like working here, but because they had other family issues that they needed to address. And it became harder and harder to replace doctors. So when we lose two doctors, mm -hmm. there's a significant impact. Right. You lose two doctors in Vancouver, well, nobody really notices. In, Van in, in Gabriola, what we're talking about is half of the doctors. Mm -hmm. And the doctors who have stayed here have done a tremendous job of trying to take up the slack, but they only have so much capacity. So now we're in that same deficit position as many of the other communities. Right. So to that point, um, we have been asking people about their experience of the healthcare system in this area, including on Gabriola. And we've heard a number of times from people on Gabriola that they are frustrated by the fact that they do not have a family doctor here, which leaves them vulnerable to clinics in town, etc. cetera. Um, can you tell us something? I know the foundation has undertake, taken a BR doctor campaign to recruit uh, doctors and nurse practitioners to the island. And I, you've had some success because Dr. Clark recently joined us. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, Dr. Clark is here on a return of service, not necessarily permanent, permanently, but certainly a great ad advantage that we've been able to bring folks in. I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at, um, primary care and uh, specifically in healthcare in general, the, the need to, con to recruit never goes away. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Speaking specifically to the reasons that I just talked about. So we have ongoing recruitment efforts and certainly we hope that those are successful, but really we need to do more than that. We need to do the more than that, not simply as a clinic or a foundation, but as an island. I mean, really, there's an opportunity, and this is some of the stuff that we're talking about in the foundation right now, and also with the clinic, to, to start to really expand, to think about health and well-being, and support people before they need health care. We're not going to see a huge influx of doctors to the system. 
we will try to make a, a, the, 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 the situation here as attractive as possible. We're not the only ones. If you look around BC, if you look around Canada, if you look around the world, there aren't enough family doctors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in BC, there are more and more doctors who are moving out of family, uh, family practice. So we can't change that. But what we can do is try to set up a system here that will support our whole person and our whole community. And I think that's the direction that we're moving. So can you report generally on how the Be Our Doctor campaign is going? Is it having results? You get a lot of interest. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess all you can do, all we can do as a foundation is, is try to create sort of leads and opportunities. But it's, it's a campaign and yet there's so much more to it. And then really when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, it's often the person to person contact, particularly between providers. Which finds a, which 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 ends up landing doctors in communities, and the doctors here are are good at that. They're good at they 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 believe in what's happening in Gabriel and they sell it well. But frankly, they're already overwhelmed with the work that they have. Yeah. You know, I mean, the the, the reason that the, that that it takes three to four weeks to get an appointment is not because they're taking their time. It's because they're trying to take on more patients than they really have capacity to because we've lost these doctors, because we're not at capacity. So I, I think that uh, the efforts to, the, the, it, it's that, it's, it's a bit of a seesaw. You know, we need them to be in communication with folks and yet we need them to be doctors. And frankly, if we were to choose, we'd pick the doctor's piece. Yeah. I assume the foundation carries a lot of that load of uh, carrying on that campaign. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, we use the, it's, you know, if any, any sort of financial resource that's required for that campaign, building the, the communication piece, that's helped by the foundation. And can you explain a bit what is being done as part of that campaign? Well, I mean, it's quite broad. I mean, we have a, we have a social media, we do advertising beyond. Uh, it's, it, it, we, we have, we're in contact with, uh, with recruiters uh, across, around the world. We're looking at every opportunity, I think, really, is what it comes down to. And we do, I mean, there's been more work in the, in the past to support residents coming to visit and, and come to the clinic, which is, you know, really what, there's an opportunity to get young doctors and show them what it's like to be on Gabriel. That we think that that's a really great opportunity. So we, anyway, any way we can support that in, in partnership with the clinic, we do that. The Canadian health care system in general and in this area uh, has been under strain for some time now. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're seeing the effects of that at the clinic. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if there if there were a, if there were lots of family doctors, if we on, on even terms with an equal supply of family doctors, I'm pretty sure that Gabriola would do pretty well. It's this where we find ourselves is, and frankly, there are small communities which are much worse off than we are. Mm -hmm. So that's really tricky. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, even you know, as you say, globally, you know, we start to say, well, we could get doctors from. Well, South Africa or another country or you know, and, and it's like it's great but there's also a sort of a social responsibility uh, taking doctors from a place where they may not be as uh, they may not be as well off and bringing them here creates a bigger problem in those in those countries so it's a really tricky thing but what we really do need and and I think this is kind of what I was pointing to is we need to relook at the system and on Gabriel uh, from a foundation point of view we can't look at the big system. We don't, have the, we don't have the influence on the big system. But we do have an opportunity to consider what a system means for Gabriola and, and what, what we really need here in order to be able to serve our community's needs. And frankly, it's not simply us doing it. At the end of the day, if we're talking about health and well-being, we need to start to look at it as a community. We need to start taking responsibility as a community. And actually, I'm going to back up on that. It's not we need to start. If I were to take a look at the foundation and the building of the clinic, we already started. Mm -hmm. And our community has shown that they really believe in that. Mm -hmm. And now we need to say, well, what does it mean now? And that's, the, that's not for the foundation to determine. It's for maybe for the foundation to work with the community to understand. In your view, then, what is that system we need on Gabriola? 
Well, I think it's the more that we can actually look at what the services we have are and connect them better to one another and connect them better to the community, the stronger web of, of, of support that we'll have. That's a start. I think the, the next piece is, okay, then what are the gaps? Who are the people who are not being served? What are the services that, they're, that, we, that they need that, that we don't have here? And how can we come together and figure out the best way to do that? And, and then there's that social determinants of health. Uh, social determinants of health are all of the things like uh, the the economy and your level of employment and your 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 your, your, your marital status and, and all of these different things that have a huge impact on our health and well-being. But we, for we, the health system, doesn't particularly consider them. And I will say, you know, uh, the, the doctors in this community and many family doctors clearly understand that those social determinants are as or more critical in a person's health than what they may be, may be doing to cure their particular need at the moment. So if we can start to, as a system, start to address those upstream concerns, the long-term impact is gonna be really positive. Do you find that the strains on the healthcare system, the fact that it is to some extent in crisis, does that inhibit your ability to hire healthcare professionals? Uh, I would say, to some extent, it's probably an understatement, and uh, uh, and absolutely. I mean, it, it it it's you know we've got this situation where everybody's looking to hire healthcare professionals. Right. I mean, an, an example. I mean, the Ministry of Health is is funding more allied health professionals, people who are social workers or or other you know, physiotherapists, other types of allied health professionals in communities. And in fact, there may be an opportunity for, for Gabriola to get funding for those. But it's great to say you're funding them. Then you have to find them. And once you find them, you have to find a place to put them. Yeah. So, so it's, and, and it's, we're not alone in that. So, I mean, it's a great time to be a healthcare professional. And unfortunately, it's a great time to be a healthcare professional in order to be hired. It's not necessarily a great time to be a healthcare professional when you're working in the field. Because what we see is most people who are working in, in understaffed positions. And they're finding that the people that, the, 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 they're, that they're providing service to sometimes don't have patients. And it becomes a very, very stressful, these roles have become more and more stressful. So that's, there, it's, it's, there's a, a complex issue that we're dealing with. Yeah. Talking more specifically about the situation today on Gabriola, there was recently uh, an incident uh, in the Life Labs medical lab at the clinic uh, in which one of the staff was, uh, as you put it, uh, subjected to, unex there was unacceptable behavior towards frontline staff at Life, at Life Labs. You also described it as another incident of bullying. Um, how have you addressed that? Well, I mean, we're in this tricky situation where internally we have no ability to address it, really. We're a landlord. So we work with the tenants as best we can to support them to address it. But we can't simply go into their, to their premises and make decisions around that. What we can do is, the, you, you spoke to the letter, um, is really speak out and, and, and ideally bring the community to a place where they understand A, the risk, but B, that this is simply not acceptable. I mean, it's tr and again, it's tricky because, you know, when people are, are finding that they're not getting the care that they got 20 years ago, or they're not able to walk into a, a Life Labs or whatever it was 20 years ago, because I think they've changed that name, uh, and, and get get what they need right away or wait for 10, 15 minutes, and they're finding they have to make an appointment and they're not getting the answers they want. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's reflective of what we see as a, a community as a whole. We're, we, we're under more duress now than we've been in a long time. And, and it shows. And, it, and really, when you're talking about at the, at the forefront of healthcare, that's where it comes out the most. So it, what can we do about that? I mean, I think I go back to you know, we're, at, we're looking at how can we support a more collective response? Can we, can we give people to understand that we're responsible for one another?
The, the, the health system is not responsible for us. We're responsible for, for, for one another. I mean, and I think the response to that letter was, was it showed just how much we understand and believe that. Right. You know, the folks who responded to that said, you know, this is not acceptable. And some of them went a little far in what their response might be. But most just said, we, we, how, do we, how do we address this? How can we not do this as a community? How can we come to a, an understanding as a community that this is simply not acceptable? The fact that Life Labs is at risk is, is something, but where would it be acceptable? Where would that be an acceptable way to behave? It would be in a restaurant? You know, yeah. in a, it's, it's just something that we just can't accept here as a, as a, as a caring community. Has that been resolved for now? Will we still have Life Labs? Uh, well, as for uh, there, there's no reason, there's, there's nothing that's been suggested that Life, Lab, Life Labs will, will leave. Uh, it's, you know, again, it's that tenuous, so that's the best answer I can give right. you. But it's tenuous because again, we are, we have no control over Life Labs. It's the, the they're, a, they're a standalone business. The, you know, I mean, you might say that their particular business model may may lead at the moment on Gabriola may lead to these kind of to, to, to incidents or if not lead to them at least make these type of incidents, incidents more likely that's not for us to, to say yeah. uh, it's certainly important for us that we have those those uh, facilities here and if life labs were to, to determine that they didn't want to be here anymore I think that the foundation would take a role in trying to to, to determine another solution to meet those needs have other staff at the clinic been feeling the brunt of, of this, uh, the pressures on everyone as a result of the situation in healthcare? Oh, I'm sure. You know, there's no question that, 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 that that's, uh, you know, and, and I think that, again, I liken it to, I, I happen to work in the world of primary care sort of all around BC. And, you know, you hear that the people who are at the front, at the, on the front line, the, the medical office assistants, very, very difficult to find and keep people. Yeah. Because particularly because you're bringing in often very people who may not have had that experience and they're they're finding that people are angry and they and they, they, they that's that's not necessarily what they signed up for yeah. on a forward looking note or maybe it's not uh, you tell me I understand the uh, clinic maintains what is called a telemedicine unit mm -hmm. can you tell me more about that not a lot more because it's in the clinic and we're the foundation right. so but I can say that you know if you, I can speak generally that telemedicine is, is certainly something that where the opportunities are growing. More and more small communities are utilizing them. I think that's, it's the interesting thing because this is where we get into this dynamic of, of where we are as an island in the community. And because of our proximity to Nanaimo, it's often assumed that we have really great access to the, to the kind of services that tele, telemedicine may may provide through in smaller communities. And the truth is, we don't necessarily, I mean, and particularly in, in, if, they're, if they're any kind of emergent service, you know, depending on when it happens, and, and, or, then it's, it's, not, it's not easier simply because we're on a, we're a ferry ride away. So there's, there, you know, and I think that the opportunities around tele telemedicine are simply going to grow. There's no question about that. Finally, you've talked about establishing a system on Gabriola that is attuned to health care, meaning more than just the foundation, more than just the clinic. Recently, uh, an initiative was approved through what I think is called the alternative approval process uh, through the RDN to fund uh, a health and well-being collaborative on the island. The, can, can you explain what that collaborative is? Well, there is an existing collaborative. Um, I, I think that the, 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 what was actually funded was a role that would support that, a coordinator yes. that, that would support that. Right. Um, the collaborative is really made up of almost all of the organizations on the island, not-for-profit organizations on the island, uh, as well as others individuals. In fact, our past president, um, uh, Diane, was, is, is one of the leaders on that table. Um, you know, I think that it, it's, you're exactly right. If we look to broaden and work collectively, then having tables like the collaborative where folks can actually talk about, you know, how we, what, what are the opportunities to do that? What's the best way to work collaboratively? What are the issues we need to face? And we're, I, I think that, you know, it's kind of interesting because we talk about healthcare 
But even if you look at not-for-profits, all the not-for-profits on this island and almost everywhere else are working with a, a deficit of resources. And sometimes we all try to take on all of the roles. And is there an opportunity to say, what if you took on this role so that I could take on that role? What if we could look at this in a different way? And I think the, those are the conversations that the collaborative begins to have. And I, you know, how it, how it kind of plays out around building this system, I think we're kind of still working through that, where some of this stuff may be held, whether it's the foundation takes a lead role in some pieces and the collaborative takes a role. But with the, end, with the, the advent of this resource that you just talked about, the collaborative has a really op a good opportunity to start to really formalize and, and, and begin to take some more some stronger action toward more, a more collaborative community. So do you think it has the potential to take some of the pressure off the clinic and, and help the clinic move forward? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that in the, I, I go back to what I said earlier, I think that all of the work of, you know, in the, particularly in the long term, all of the work where where we're, where folks, whether they're in health or whether they're in social services and supports, where they're not feeling isolated and they're able to connect to one another, is takes the pressure off. It's, that's the opportunity to do that. So, I abs absolutely, I think that that's the that's that's one of the advantages we see. Jeff, thank you for taking the time to talk with me, and thank you to all of those of you who serve uh, the foundation and through you to all the people who work in our clinic and keep us healthy. Oh. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak as well.